for uh, the next talk. So the next talk is on uh, machine learning for multi-phase flow modeling in pipelines. Uh, this is uh, this talk is by our colleagues from Shell. Uh, Shell is the industrial partner for this uh, Indo-Dutch project. And uh, Ankit and Abhinit from uh, Shell R&D unit in India are going to talk, uh, give this particular talk. Uh, Ankit is working as an AI resident in system modeling group at uh, Shell. He did his PhD from IASC uh, in the area of uh, computational fluid dynamics. And uh, thereon, he has worked in various uh, AI and machine learning roles. Uh, and now is uh, uh, you know, part of AI residence in system modeling at Shell. Uh, Abhinit Gupta uh, is also from system modeling team at Shell. Uh, he obtained his uh, um, uh, bachelor's degree from IIT Kanpur in aerospace engineering. Uh, he uh, finished his master's from TU Delft and his PhD from uh, TU Eindhoven in computational fluid dynamics. Uh, so over to you, uh, Abhinit and Ankit. Uh, Thank you. Uh, can you hear me well? Yeah. Okay, cool. Yes, we can hear loud here. Great, thank you. So thanks everyone for joining. Thank you, uh, Shashi, for the kind introduction. So uh, I, along with Ankit, uh, my colleague from Shell Technology Center, Bangalore, will give this talk on the machine learning for multi-phase flows. I'll set up the context and then Ankit will take you through more technical details. And I hope we'll have some time for Q&A towards the end. So next slide, please. So this is just a cautionary note. It basically says that all statements in this presentation are forward looking and basically you should not make any investment decisions based on this slide pack. So yeah, please don't do that. Uh, I'll let it flash for a few seconds and then maybe we can go next, yeah, okay. Uh, so multi-phase flows are highly complex non-linear phenomenon and they are encountered in several industrial applications, predominantly in uh, oil and gas pipelines. In general, several flow patterns can exist depending on the velocities of the two phases, the densities, the viscosity, the surface tension between the phases, the diameter of the piping, and more importantly, the inclination of the piping itself. The flow can be laminar or turbulent, steady, unsteady. Gas and liquid can occur as segregated flows. Liquid can flow as droplets within gas or gas can flow as bubbles within the liquid. To simplify the modeling of such flows, we distinguish between a limited number of typical multi-phase flow patterns, multi-phase flow structures or so-called the flow patterns. Uh, these flow patterns for the horizontal and the vertically inclined sections have been demonstrated here. So for the vertical, we have uh, the bubble flow, the slug, which is a sort of an unstable flow, churn flow, and the annular. And for the horizontal, it can be annular, dispersed, stratified slug, which is again an intermittent or unstable flow, or the dispersed bubble within the hor uh, horizontal piping. Next slide, please. Yes. Uh, so the design and analysis of uh, multi-phase flows in wells, pipelines, or risers, uh, typically used in oil and gas industry, is dependent on semi-empirical physics-based correlations. Uh, physics-based because uh, we can use the 1D momentum equation for individual phases to model these flows. However, the uh, there are some terms within those equations that have uh, that have been shown here for the 1D multi-phase flows that needs to be closed. And if we are taking a 1D system, a 1D modeling approach, we don't have a right uh, direct answer for that. In this case, the wall shear stresses are actually approximated by correlations, and that brings the empirical nature within the, uh, this modeling approach. Uh, furthermore, um, to uh, actually come, come up with the right type of momentum equation, we also need to first understand what is the flow pattern. Uh, within this system. And these flow patterns are also determined by using some empirical stability criteria. But once we have the correct stability criteria to determine the flow pattern, and we uh, have the correct set of correlations uh, to determine, uh, to close the shear stresses, then we can use these equations to predict the flow regime, the pressure drop, and the liquid holder for a multi-phase flow pipeline. Shell flow correlations, uh, which is uh, developed in, within Shell over the past few decades, on the third party software called the Olga Pipeline Simulators are examples of such multi-phase uh, physics-based uh, semi-empirical correlations. Yes. 
So uh, the traditional engineering models like SFC or Olga primarily used in business development uh, are very fast, uh, but they also ignore certain physical effects. So the results, uh, this results in significant uncertainties, which can put a constraint over the overall project design and process optimization. To achieve both efficiency and accuracy, we took a hybrid approach where we tried to develop a data-driven model. So still it's a data-driven model. And later we tried to probably include some of the physics-based aspects like uh, discussed by Karen in the previous talk, for example, the pin-based modeling or the model reduction. But as of now, we developed the data-driven model, which uh, is based on the numerical data, which comes from the existing uh, correlation software, as well as the bunch of experimental data that we had available within Shell for the prediction of flow characteristics within these multi-phase flow pipelines. The approach that we took is as follows. So first we generate, we use the shell flow correlations and, and the interface of it's actually called shell flow explorer. So we use shell flow explorer to generate numerical data to complement the existing experimental databases. To this end, we generated around 100,000 data points using the shell flow correlations. We first use the numerical data to train our ML algorithm. Uh, Ankit will talk in, uh, later in more detail about the types of algorithm that were chosen. And then the same machine learning algorithm was fine to use using the transfer learning approach and using the using our existing experimental data sets. The final mature machine learning model can then be used to predict the flow variables within a real system, within the real pipeline. And the benefit or the uh, unique quality of this approach is that the model can be incrementally trained on new data sets that comes up with time and avoiding the need to train the model from scratch. So we can develop a model which can be incrementally, uh, and if we of course test it well, and. Uh, before uh, making any changes from the production environment, we can have a model which can be incrementally improved as we have more information, more data sets available. So, uh, so before making any model, we of course have to need to look into the available data sets. So this is broadly the distribution of the data set. We primarily had three set of experimental data sets. The number one is what we call the backend shell flow database. It's based on several experiments that uh, were conducted for the development of shell flow correlation and has around 1200 data points. Uh, then uh, uh, shell also worked in a collaboration with the University of Tulsa and there's a wealth of uh, experimental database there. It has around 12,000 12, 600 data points. Then there is another database which was developed in, uh, in collaboration with several different universities, and that is the SFC experimental database. In addition, as I just mentioned, that we uh, generated additional 100,000 data points uh, using the shell flow correlation. So this all in all around uh, 115,000 data points were used for our training, uh, and uh, we'll go into more detail about how that was done. But before we go further, let's have a look into the how the data looked like. So first, the data that was generated from the shelf local relations, the 100,000 data points. Uh, we used the sampling technique called the Latin hypercube sampling for this purpose uh, to generate these 100 data points. This technique basically allows random sampling while minimizing the correlations and dividing the uh, variables into intervals with equal probability. So it's a uniform volume filling uh, design of experiment type of approach. Uh, we chosen 10 uh, input uh, 10 input uh, values or 10 input features for our algorithm the liquid and gas velocities the densities uh, the viscosities the pipe diameter the inclination uh, the roughness and the surface tension and we took the range of all these variables uh, in a, in a range which is typically encountered in industrial pipelines uh, rest of the parameters were uh, re realized that does not have that much of a significant impact. And in fact, if you do a POD type of approach using a bunch of data for this, we'll come up with variables which comes out to be around eight or so. And I'll, uh, if you do a uh, Buckingham Pi theorem, apply a Buckingham Pi theorem, which I'll tell a bit about later, then we'll get around eight variables, which basically represents the physics of the system. So this is how the, uh, now I'll show you how the database looks like, uh, the numerical database looks like. Uh, for the pipe inclination, we carefully choose a tri-model distribution, which basically means that we have three peaks centered around the zero degree, which represents the horizontal flows, centered around the 90 degree and the minus 90 degree, which represents the vertical flows going up and going down. 
this is how the distribution of the superficial liquid and gas velocities looks like in a um, log log x pi plot. And you can see that it's more or less volume filling uh, across different ranges of uh, the x y velocities. Um, for these chosen input variables, uh, the flow pattern was dominantly annular. So uh, this is something that can uh, provide some uncertainty in the output that we get out of the model, but this is something we are looking into further. And then we got a nice uh, Gaussian type of distribution, uh, non-uniform Gaussian type of distribution for both the pressure as well as the liquid holdup as an output that we receive from our model. So basically the model took 10 inputs and generated the out three outputs, which have been listed in the lower row here, which are the, uh, the flow pattern, the liquid holdup and the pressure drop with the given distribution. Now also let's have a look, how does our uh, experimental database look like? So the experimental database, as you mentioned, has around 16,000 data points. But uh, unfortunately, not for all of these 16,000 data points, we have the information available for uh, all three desired output variables, that is the pressure drop, the flow pattern, and the liquid holdup. So it's basically a subset of it for which we have this information available, and we accordingly split the data. Uh, but if we look more closely over the distribution here, probably the similar properties that we see for the shell flow correlation uh, data generated from the shell flow correlation. We have a more number of data points for the zero degree pipeline, horizontal incline, than some for 90 degree, and some uh, few, but still, uh, still you can see a small peak there on the minus 90 degree. And, Again, a more or less sort of a Gaussian distribution for the pressure drop as well as the liquid holdup. Uh, here, the, uh, the flow patterns were more uniform, and that basically gives us, uh, that can help us actually for our model to generalize better in terms of uh, predicting the uh, different flow patterns. So, this is how the overall database looks like uh, moving forward. Yes, uh, so we have looked into the database. Now we have to understand what are the input and output features that we desire. Uh, so as I discussed that, the typical variables of interest are the densities for both liquid and gases, since we are considering a multi-phase flows, uh, the, uh, the two viscosities, the surface tension between the liquid and gas. Uh, surface tension between the liquid and the interface of the gas and the interface can be additional properties, but we did not consider because it does not have a very significant uh, effect on overall uh, behavior of the system, at least in terms of pressure drop. Uh, the pipe diameter, the roughness of the pipe itself, and the inclination, the acceleration due to gravity also forms as an important parameter, and the two superficial uh, liquid and gas velocities. Now, if we either do a POD type of approach or we do a simple Buckingham by theorem, we realize that we have around 11 uh, input parameters here. Uh, three fundamental dimensions. Those are the dimensions of the length, the time, and the mass. So if we apply the Buckingham Pi theorem, we can uh, we come up to the conclusion that this system should be represented by eight dimensionless groups. Uh, I'll show those dimensionless groups. And similarly, for the output, we have the pressure liquid or the pressure drop and the liquid holdup. Pressure drop can be also normalized using these non-dimensional, uh, these three dimensionless groups. And the liquid holdup itself, a quantity which is non-dimension, non-dimensional. So moving forward, um, uh, these are the eight uh, input variables that we came across, uh, that we decided to use the in eight input features based on the analysis of us, uh, based on the physical understanding of the system that which are the input relevant input variables. And then furthermore, applying uh, Buckingham Pi theorem on that. This is also something that has been traditionally used in literature and consistent with the existing literature. Uh, these parameters are the Reynolds number for the gas, the Reynolds number for the liquid, uh, the Weber number, which basically caters the effect of the inertia with respect to surface tension. Uh, the inclination of the pipe, the ratio of the surface tension with respect to the diameter, the two density ratios, which is also something very important. And uh, another factor to capture the effect of uh, acceleration due to gravity, which is the ratio of inertial forces to the gravitational forces uh, captured by the Froude number for the gas and the liquid. Moving forward. Yeah, so with that, I'll hand over to Ankit. Ankit, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Vinit, for your talk. Uh, now, from here, uh, I will. Uh, uh, first of all, can you can you hear me? 
Uh, yes, we can hear you well. Please go ahead. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. So first, uh, the machine learning model that we have chosen is uh, XGBoost. So XGBoost is a type of uh, decision tree. Uh, decision tree basically is a, uh, is a flow chart visualization technique in which, uh, uh, which along a given path, we can arrive at a particular decision. Uh, the decision will be dependent on the path uh, that we have chosen. So in the decision, the first node is the root node. And on the subsequent nodes, the node is split it into child node. And this, uh, uh, the nodes, the, uh, the nodes are the basically the features uh, which Abhinith has talked about, uh, the Reynolds number, the Babam number, the Proud number, etc. And uh, and basic, uh, basically based on some decision uh, with respect to a feature, these trees are splitted and ultimately uh, uh, we arrive at the, uh, at the, uh, uh, at the terminate, terminal node where there, is no, uh, where there is no further splitting happens. Typically in a decision tree, when we, uh, when we build the full decision tree, the model, the decision tree tend to overfit the data and hence we need the pruning, we need to do the pruning of the decision tree. Uh, basically, there are two types of uh, uh, models which, which are built on decision tree. One is the bagging technique and another one is the boosting technique. Uh, the, bagging, uh, the examples of bagging techniques are random forest, uh, which trains the decision tree sequentially. And finally, the majority vote of the decision tree is taken into consideration for the final outcome of the model. Whereas uh, the boosting techniques like XGBoost, LightGPM, and CatBoost uh, builds the decision tree sequentially. And also, uh, unlike the uh, bagging technique like random forest, XGBoost basically trains on the residual of the uh, target variable. So firstly, a base model is built, uh, which is known as the initial model F0. And then this F0 is used to predict the target variable. And from this, uh, from the prediction of the base model, we calculate the residual, uh, which is uh, the basically the difference between the target variable and the uh, prediction from the base model. And this uh, residual becomes the uh, target variable for the subsequent trees and uh, uh, and uh, then for the at the next step a new model h1 is fitted and this is fitted to the not on the absolute value of the target variable but on the residual of the previous step and then this base uh, then this model base model and the uh, residual which is predicted by the next decision tree are combined together and then this gives the final prediction of the next decision tree so here what i uh, what i'm trying to say is that the final prediction of the model or the uh, of, at the next uh, decision tree is the sum of the uh, prediction from the previous step and plus some hyperparameter into the residual what we achieve in the current uh, decision tree then the second model which we have taken is the light GPM. Uh, basically, the difference between the light GPM and the XG boost is that the XG boost uh, uh, splits the data by uh, by have, by not having any preference, or it performs random sampling all on the all on the uh, all the instances of the data, whereas the light GPM keep all the instances of the la large gradients and because the large gradients tends to have uh, large higher error so it took all the instances of the large gradients for splitting the optimal splitting the data and then and keep the random sampling on the instances with smaller gradients next model which we have chosen is the cat boost uh, it is also a gradient boot boosting technique uh, the XG boost and light GPM build asymmetric trees, uh, whereas the CAT boost are balanced, uh, build oblivious trees which are balanced, and uh, uh, it is less prone to overfitting because the over, as I said, that the overfitting is directly related to the depth of the decision tree, and since uh, uh, CAT boost builds 
balance trees so so that the gap or uh, this uh, so that so we have effective pruning of the decision tree and it can uh, lead to less uh, prone to overfitting also because it's a uh, symmetric trees uh, it can also speed up the prediction at the testing time the next model which we have considered is the uh, neural network where we have input all the features all the dimensionless parameters which have been talk, talked about and the output are the uh, non dimensional pressure gradient uh, liquid hold up which is already non dimensionalized and the uh, flow pattern uh, so the, uh, here we build the neural network uh, which has uh, uh, the input layer the hidden layers and the output layer uh, the weight matrix kinds of give us a transformation between the next layer and the previous layer then we do the forward pass with each of these parameters and we arrive at the uh, prediction of the target variable and then uh, the model is trained by the back propagation algorithm in which uh, the prediction from the model is uh, the error is calculated by subtracting the prediction from the model from the Uh, from the actual data which we have and then this error is back propagated into the network and in each time step weights are updated and uh, the main problem with uh, neural network is the overfitting problem uh, which is more relevant in the case of when we has less amount of data uh, generally uh, 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 what we have done is that we have taken a uh, uh, three layer and with uh, some uh, smaller number of neurons and we keep adding the neurons as well as the hidden layer until uh, we achieve uh, until the testing error is minimized and by if we if we put more number of neurons or we increase the uh, hidden layers then the error tends to keep worse uh, tends to get worse and so we have kind of an optimized uh, type of neural architecture so here what we have done is that like, as i've been said first we have trained this ml models on the synthetic data set which has been developed with the help of mechanistic model like uh, shell flow explorer and then uh, this model has been taken and then it is trained on the lab lab experiment so here the ml model was initially trained on shell flow explorer and then the, we update the ml model based on different experimental data set so now uh, for the mechanistic uh, synthetic uh, data set which we have developed of about 1 lakh uh, we have done the training validation and test split into 70 into 20 into 10% uh, uh, and then what we have achieved is the pressure uh, drop the uh, the number of data set for pressure drop uh, liquid hold up and flow pattern in training data set is around 70000 then around 18000 for validation split and test split is around 10000 so a validation split around to get the better model as well as to tune the hyperparameter similarly uh, for the uh, experimental data set uh, we also did the same amount of split between training validation and test around 4000 uh, uh, for pressure drop around 5000 for liquid hold up and around 3000 for flow pattern has been uh, in the training data set similarly for validation and the test data set so here are the some of the results uh, which uh, what we have achieved and here we have also built one kind of a linear combination model in which we have taken the prediction from the xt boost light gbm and cat boost and then uh, what we have taken is the uh, output from this three models and then we did the linear combination by uh, by training by uh, by uh, some hyperparameters and those hyperparameters has been tuned by the linear regression and the weights of those uh, hyperparameter has been given at the top so here we have on the training data set what on one lakh uh, shell flow explorer points we have achieved of r square of around 98 percent and rmsc around 0.008 and this rmsc is based on the 
on the normalized data set uh, and not on the and not on the true value so the uh, normalized values are between 0 and 1 so this rmse is the normalized rmse and then when we do the uh, uh, transfer learning or the incremental models on the experimental data set we have achieved the r square of around 99 greater than 99 uh, roughly about the same RMSE as on the training data set. So here are the different comparison between the different uh, machine learning models. And we have achieved a good amount of uh, uh, accuracy uh, for the pressure drop prediction. Similarly, for the liquid holdup uh, uh, prediction, uh, we, uh, the same linear combination model is built and the weights is given above. And we have achieved around 98% R square on the training data set, uh, which is the on the synthetic SFP points. And when we do the transfer learning on the experimental data set or incremental training on the experimental data set, we have achieved around R, R square of uh, uh, greater than 95. Uh, and here, uh, we can uh, here neural network tends to perform little. Uh, as, uh, poorer as compared to the tree based models. And uh, this can be attributed because we have a limited amount of uh, our experimental data and neural network tends to overfit uh, quite rapidly as compared to the tree based models. So next is the flow pattern prediction. And here, uh, uh, on the right hand side is the on the left hand side is the confusion matrix between the predicted level and the true level. Uh, zero means the annular uh, bubble, uh, one means the bubble, uh, two means the churn, uh, three means the slug, and four means the stratified. So if we look at closely at the confusion matrix, uh, what we find is that out of the 191 uh, annular data in the uh, in uh, annular uh, in the training data set, in the uh, in the training data set, we have cl uh, correctly classified 185 of them. We have correctly identified bubble, churn, and slug for all the data. And for the uh, stratified, out of the 111, one, on 103, we have correct, correctly identified the stratified. So this uh, uh, this has achieved the F1 micro score of uh, 98 on the training data set of on synthetic data and around uh, greater than 95 percent on the incremental data uh, training on the experimental data set. So uh, the conclusion uh, is that we have developed different uh, tree based uh, uh, boosting uh, algorithms as well as the neural network. Uh, the gradient boosting algorithm, which what we have trained in, are the XGBoost, LightGBM, and the CatBoost. And this has been used for the prediction of uh, uh, different flow variables like pressure drop, liquid holdup, and flow pattern in multi-phase pipe sections. Uh, the, also, we have considered the weighted average of the tree based models, and the weights has been, um, uh, has, been uh, has been used by the linear regression. So we have achieved the weighted average of the tree based model has above 99% for pressure drop and 95% for liquid holder. Flow pattern prediction has achieved an accuracy of uh, 95%. Uh, we, have, we have observed that uh, there is a marginal decrease in the accuracy of the neural network as compared to tree based models. And this we have attributed to the overfitting of the uh, overfitting due to the less amount of experimental data. So in the next step, uh, in the future, what we, what we are planning to do is that we want to expand our synthetic data set. Presently, we are using from the shell flow explorer uh, tool. We want to incorporate the synthetic data points from other mechanistic tools like Olga. And we want to see how our machine learning model trains on that. Uh, second thing is we want to do is like whatever experimental data set we have, uh, we want to uh, 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 we want to calculate the error, and this calculation of the error is between the uh, between the real values of the pressure drop or other flow variables from the data set, and from the shell flow explorer tool. Uh, so what we want to develop is the machine learning model. 
with the feature what i have explained and the target variable will be the error and this error is between the uh, is the difference of the values between the experimental data set and from the mechanistic uh, models and then we will uh, train and then identify the outliers out of it uh, so that's all so i want to give acknowledgement uh, to all these people who have contributed to our project and thank you and we will be happy to take uh, any questions uh, thank you ankit and abinit uh, for a very nice talk uh, i see some very good results as well uh, if uh, uh, you have questions uh, if kindly type it in the message window and then i will you know uh, pass it on to abinit and ankit Uh, in the meantime, uh, I had a, a very basic uh, question, ge more general question. So, um, uh, while, while the accuracy of your methods is quite good, uh, uh, what, what what is the impact of you know interpretability of your model? So, you know, you're using this model for something, and you get an output. But I guess it would depend upon where you plan to use the model. how important the interpretability of uh, you know the models that you have trained so can you comment on that or your view yes uh, uh, so yes, thanks yes. a uh, very good question and i think something similar i hear in the uh, chat box as well that it's sort of as of now acting as a back black box model so uh, and that's true uh, so the idea is that uh, we uh, use the wealth of data that we have and to come up with a model Uh, that gives good accuracy, and then along with good accuracy, uh, some of the results that we could not show here that we are not just looking for accuracy, but also a more ro uh, robust model. So even if the error is slightly higher, uh, for some cases it should not give uh, uh, real garbage results for uh, some of the outliers. So the outliers should be minimum. But even with that, it's sort of a black black box model. Uh, we have some thoughts on uh, further developing and fixing that and uh, those can be um, along the methods that were discussed uh, by karen in the previous talk uh, one example could be that we can further fine tune the model by defining a loss uh, based on uh, something similar to the physics informed neural networks where we can uh, force our network to also satisfy the one day momentum equation for both the uh, uh, both the uh, gas and the liquid however that also comes with a challenge is that as of now our model is by definition a one day model and that means that we still need the correlation for the uh, shear stresses uh, and if the shear stresses correlation are as good as that employed in the uh, shelf flow correlation itself then even the additional fine tuning that we get using pins type of framework where we incorporate some physics based aspect it won't do any good so we, the idea is that we can come up with better uh, empirical models that can be also uh, put as a loss function within the framework itself and that will increase the inter, uh, interpretability or makes it you know uh, more closely satisfying the momentum equation at some level does that answer your question yeah that that does answer my question but i think the next question uh, from benjamin is also closely related and it's uh, um, it, it seems to me that sfc sfe is uh, usefully in a black box setting would it be possible to take into account the knowledge of the physical models in the learning problem uh, oh, so would right. you like to add something to uh so i think i partially answered that uh, by the model itself sfc sfe are uh, semi empirical physics based so there is still momentum equation that we are solving but the closure relations are empirical based uh and uh, yes uh, i mean uh, there are challenges but it should be possible to uh, uh basically take into account the knowledge of physics model in this learning problem and pens is uh, one idea that i can think of where we can do that but uh, i would be very happy to uh, hear other suggestions that uh, how else for this one day type of problem we can uh, put some physics based aspects in this data driven model and uh, uh, make it you know more generalizable by doing that So this is yeah. something we have been asking ourselves that what is, can be uh, done uh, to make yes, it more generalized. Yes, something interesting to uh, think about. Uh, th there are two more questions. Uh, if live customer data fit into both category asymmetric as symmetric tree, then how will you select tree based algo? Uh, um, Ankit, would you like to take that? Yeah, I mean, I didn't get the question completely. Yeah, can you just repeat one? 
Uh, yeah, so may, may, maybe we could take it offline, this question. And then uh, mm -hmm. finally, there is a question on slide 22. You have, with some, uh, you have quite some outliers uh, with XG boost more than with others, you know, at least visually. In uh, practice, one uh, could prefer many small outliers instead of a few large ones. That is a different norm for the error might be needed. Could you please comment? Uh, okay. um, for that, uh, we have also checked the robustness of the model. So we have also done some uh, uh, validation splits and we have uh, taken some 10 splits uh, or uh, 5 splits or 10 splits. And we have checked the robustness model of the model, whatever error we get, uh, so we get the range of models. And then what we have achieved is like we have done the box plot kind of thing on the uh, robustness of the model and then what we have what we are trying to see is if the length of the box and the median of the box is much lower than the other other models then we will we tend to choose uh, that particular model for our final prediction uh, so that the means what i was trying to say is that whenever we do the different type of uh, train test splits and then in those train test splits whatever error we get and those errors are in the same range uh, for a particular model. We tend to select that particular model. And, uh, and also at the same time, uh, the mean uh, median prediction from that model should also be lower as compared to other models. Uh, thanks, uh, Ankit. Uh, so again, uh, thanks, uh, Abhinit and Ankit for a very nice talk. Uh,